The sermon for this evening is from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. The sermon is entitled, Joyfully Lutheran, the sixth petition, lead us not into temptation. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. Harrison writes in Joyfully Lutheran as we are reading that book throughout, he says right there, At your direction, O Lord, I pray. The devil, the world, and my flesh are on constant attack. Every moment I feel the desires of the flesh. Every moment the world presses me hard. Every second of the day the devil plots my demise. I pray this sixth petition. When I start the day, I pray it during the day. I pray it before I lay at night. I pray it amid every trial and temptation. You are my only hope. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Such pinpoint words from President Pastor Harrison. Because there we find truly what we are up against. We're not just living life on the surface, are we? We very well know there is a deeper spiritual battle at hand. The constant attack, not just sometimes, right? The ploy, the plot, the strategy, every angle, every opportune time, day and night, 24-7. The trials and temptations are there. Trials and temptations that we are unable to battle ourselves to overcome. And thus we pray that God would guard and keep us from the devil, the world, and even our own sinful nature. In Mark chapter 14, at Gethsemane, right before Jesus' betrayal, we very well know what Jesus was doing there about the will of God, that his will be done and there when he went off to pray, he told his disciples, watch and pray, stay awake, be alert, lest you fall into temptation, because the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Right? <laughs> the flesh is weak. It was almost like a preview for these disciples, for what was to come would be so foreign to what they could ever imagine. And even though the Lord had foretold what was to come, when it actually happened, wow, it seemed like the world was turned upside down. They were uprooted. And though Jesus would go on to win and give us victory at Calvary, fulfilling the promise that he so promised to do, we still, in this flesh, at this moment, right now, we still continue to battle the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. This is the Christian life. At times, it's full of suffering. At times, it's not easy. The devil is prowling, ready and waiting, poking and prodding, conniving he is. The evil foe tempts you to turn, right? That's his main goal, to turn you away from God. Whatever that will be, he will do his best to turn you away. Even telling you, you can have all the things of this world if you turn away from God. Telling you, God is not there. Stop praying. You just need to trust in yourself above all things. Telling you, dependence is not the way, independence is the way. 
And the devil will continue. He will never stop until the end of time. His goal is to turn you from the living word of God, the living Christ, his promise, his grace, his mercy, to turn you away from God and towards that dark path. Or we very well know how easy of a temptation it can be that this path will become so comfortable to us as we sit in our own or walk in our own shoes on this path. And we know this has happened ever since the beginning with Adam and Eve. The devil tempted them in the same way. Not only is it the devil, but it's also the world. In a couple of weeks, we're going to celebrate All Saints Day. And there we're going to go through the Beatitudes, Matthew 5. And there we know that first Beatitude, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Right? The world says otherwise. The world says, no, don't be poor in spirit. Be rich in the world. Be number one. Find your security within this world. Find your comfort, your fulfillment, whatever it is, your worldly wealth, and cherish them because that's where you will find your richness. This is where you will find your definition and how how tempting it is to turn to these very things for those results when at the end of the day it leaves you more empty than before. Not only is it devil, not only is it the world, but it's also the flesh, our sinful nature. Galatians 5. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. Romans 7. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have desired to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, we pray to the Lord because we need him. We pray to the Lord because the life of independence only leads to terror and despair and destruction. We pray to our Lord because we know that he is the only one who can actually help and guard us against the temptations that are ever before us, these spiritual attacks. They were with the disciples then. And for us now, it is the same. And we know this. Yet how great of a temptation it is to just continue in our ways. To go on our merry way, thinking that all things are well. Thinking that, well, we hope that all things will fall into place. That if we just puzzle piece everything together by our own way, by our own will, all things will be well. I just need to trust in myself, set up my future, get all these pieces intact, and there I will find my kingdom, there I will find my fulfillment, and there I will fulfill the masterpiece that I desire for myself. The devil, the world, the flesh, that's all they say to you and to me. I love this. I was reading Luther uh, today uh, pertaining to the sixth petition in Luther's works, and it says, um, pertaining to the sixth petition, he writes, Oh, I have to look after the beer and malt. I can't go to hear a sermon. Or if you do come to church to hear the sermon, you go to sleep. You don't take it in. You have no delight, no love, no reverence for the world or for the word. I think he wrote this because he shows us the constant temptation whether it's not going to church or even going to church, and there you just sit there and passing apathetically in one ear out the other, constantly we are up against the noise. Don't you see? Like relentless waves crashing onto the seashore, never ending, constant these temptations are, as they're continually thrown your way, second after second, breath after breath, moment after moment. This is what's happening, you guys, in our lives. It's not just a coincidence or a happenstance. It's not just things just happen that way. But spiritually speaking, there is a spiritual warfare in the midst of us. And these aren't just empty threats, right? 
This, is just, this, is, this isn't just a figment of our imagination. This is a reality. The devil, the world, the flesh. Yes, these attacks are real. Yet it is not something, again, that we are able to battle ourselves. We can't just tell ourselves, do better, or I just got to be better. No. We pray, Lord, help me, rescue me, save me, comfort me, defend me, because I fall short in my sin. And I need you, Heavenly Father, to guard and protect and lead me by your way, that you may lead us not into temptation. You know, we very well know that God tempts no one. He's not here to destroy you, but he is here to protect you. By his word, God's gracious promise, Jesus, his victorious power, Jesus, his conquering truth, Jesus, who will set you free. That our faith rests solely upon Christ and his work. This is how the battle has been won. Jesus, from Genesis 3, the first gospel, from the offspring of a woman, will come the Savior of the world who would do what? Crush the devil's work. The reason why Jesus came to this world is to destroy the devil's work. Yes, it's a battle out there. But there Jesus is to give you his conquering truth. And we see it in Jesus in his life, right? All throughout Christ came to the world. Faithfully, he lived a life perfect, not for himself, but for you, right? Thrown in the desert, 40 days, 40 nights, hungry, thirsty, tired, you name it, susceptible, right? Vulnerable. Not only that, but was the evil foe there, right? Satan himself tempting him once, twice, three times. Jesus said to the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And by the very word of God, as the word made flesh, as the one who is the word, there he overcame the devil. And you thought that was good but even more as it pointed to, ultimately, his own crucifixion. I can imagine everyone thought they had overcome the king. Even the devil was probably snickering, saying, we got him, we got him. That was not the case. Harrison writes, Jesus suffered everything we sinners suffer, and he overcame all for us in our place. So it writes in 1 Peter, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, thou know, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have even been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You have the living hope. You do face trials. You do face sufferings. The temptations are there, but you're not alone. God is with you. The victory of Christ is yours. So when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we hearken back to the cross, where there Jesus endured faithfully for you. His death and resurrection would be and is your living hope. That in the midst of all the temptations, the assaults of the devil, the Lord says, be gone, Satan. I give them victory. 
It's because of the cross and empty tomb that our Lord guides and protects and comforts us through these trying times, because trying times they are. The Christian life is not all about the promising of the good times and of the prosperous times. That's not what the Christian life is. The Christian life is about Christ, the Christ who leads and preserves each and every one of you, the Christ who continues to lead you in the faith, enduring and persevering, watching and praying, knowing that the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the next time you pray, lead us not into temptation. Know this, that the Lord guards you and protects you, that you live in His refuge. And through all things, when you are suffering, never think that you are alone, because in faith and prayer, you very well know that Jesus has given you the victory, reconciling you to the Father, as He is your true Father, and we are His true children. If you're not, I have called you by name, and you are mine. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Midweek Sermon from Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorepark.com dot com.